Um, so uh, I would say I fall into uh, those who do not hold, hold the view that uh, the coming automation will replace large segments of uh, working population for reasons that I'll try to outline uh, in my talk. Uh, but nonetheless, I see uh, technological change as a first multifactorial process, second process uh, dominated by structural dynamics of um, capital accumulation and uh, division of labor in the world system. Um, and I see it as a site of contestation. And uh, I'll try to talk to this notion uh, of technology as a site of uh, contestation. Um, and lastly, I, I do maintain that uh, technological transition, though there is a lot of uh, uh, buzz and hype uh, around this, uh, should be taken seriously. There is a qualitative change uh, in terms of technological base, but also the organization of capitalist production into which I won't go here in this talk, but uh, it should be used as uh, a political opportunity. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> as this isotype visualization by Otto and Marie Neurath from 1930s suggests, automation and technological unemployment are a recurrent phenomenon and a recurrent feature of public debate. The talk of the end of work, or in its modern day variant, the post work, has also been with us since at least the publication of Jeremy Rifkin's eponymous book in 1995, if not since 1970s and the beginning of the great neoliberal shake up. Think of the writings of Andre Gods, for instance. Uh, this is not but unjustified. Commonly, the employment growth is understood as a differential between the output growth and the productivity growth. This fundamental identity implies that for as long as the output growth outpaces the productivity growth, not all pr productivity enhancing technology necessarily leads to unemployment. However, since 1950s, the world, world economy's output has been decelerating and in 1970s was outpaced by productivity growth. As output growth rates have gone down, productivity rates have gone up, the unemployment has expanded. Capitalism does need less labor today. Over the last couple of decades, the technological change uh, has made large segments of the industrial workforce, along with its qualifications, redundant, particularly in advanced economies, uh, of the world. According to a survey conducted under Barack Obama's administration, in the US the participation rate of economically active men in the age group 25 to 54 has gone down over the last half of century from 98% to 88%, primarily because of technological change, but also record levels of incarceration of prime major African American men who are nonetheless laboring away in the US uh, prison industrial complex. Immediately after Donald Trump's electoral victory, a number of leading labor economists went on record stating that a majority of lost jobs cannot be brought back, again primarily because of technological change. While some 2.4 million US manufacturing jobs were lost to China, another 5 million were lost to automation. In 1970s, General Motors produced fewer vehicles than today with three times as many workers. Whereas its, uh, sorry, um, Walmart, as the world's largest private employer, has over 2.6 million workers. Whereas its prospective contender, Amazon.com, only 350,000. Judging by the current growth of Amazon.com, if and once Amazon.com revenue reaches the level of Walmart's, it will require about a million and a half workers less. This parallel and combined restructuring of the labor market through globalization of production and technological change is become, becoming also a major cause of political instability in capitalist democracies. As recent political shakeups shake have shown, the working class in advanced 
uh, in, um, sorry, the working class and advanced economies, mostly white, middle-aged men and their families that can still recall the period of so-called good jobs that once formed the backbone of national economy have now become a fulcrum of political strategies directed against the political establishment. The rise of the radical and nativist right in the core of Western capitalism, the US, the UK, France and Germany, saw its legitimating flywheel in the social discontent of that part of the electorate. The fact is that the neoliberal governmentality has done away with any notion that the democratic participation of the popular masses may exert any impact on the imperatives of global integrated economic processes and thus protect them from the deleterious effects of the economic restructuring. So much so that only the inane electoral promises of the return to strong protectionist nationalism and thus to restoration of all jobs can nowadays mobilize a part of that disenfranchised populace to go out and vote. Yet these political troubles uh, might turn out to be trivial to what awaits in the future. If we are to believe the cautioning warnings, the loss of full employment and jobs in the previous decades are nothing to what seems to be lying in the wings of the decades ahead of us. In their oft-referenced study on the future of labor from 2013, the Oxford Martin School researchers Carl Benedict Frey and Michael Osborne have analyzed the technological replaceability of jobs in the US labor market and have concluded that no less than 47% of all jobs fall into the category of high risk of replacement. Such a drastic figure that Fry and Osborne arrive at is based on their novel approach to analyzing replaceability. They don't assume technologies that are already in use, but rather technologies that are scheduled to become generalized only in the coming decades. The technological mix that accounts for this drastic shift is made of big data, artificial intelligence, and mobile robotics. Yet, one should not fully buy into the narrative of drastic unemployment. As a study, um, sorry. Um, as, yet one should not fully buy into the narrative of drastic unemployment. As a study published in early 2017, and there have been others earlier, um, this one by McKinsey Global Institute warns, the replaceability analysis still does not take into account the complexity of replacement in actual occupational situations, where occupations still include a large number of non-automatable tasks. If this complexity is taken into account, it is as low as 5% of occupations that will become fully automated, while the process of automation might drag out decades into the future. So, the situation might not turn out as drastic as predicted by Osborne and Fry. Thus, betting on radical unemployment to transform our economy into a post-work economy or post-work society is premised on rather weak assumptions. Nonetheless, it's an opening for politics and an opening for technopolitics. Um, so if post-work society cannot be achieved of its own, it nonetheless means we, cannot, we can achieve it ourselves. In fact, the negative relation between productivity growth and employment growth is not strictly a causal relation. If we look back to the history of capitalist development, over the long term, their interdependence is rather weak. The primary reason for that is that in capitalist societies, the labor market is the fundamental mechanism of social integration. Thus, the majority of the population must find work to secure for themselves and their family food on the table and roof over the head. In developed consumer societies, one or two items more. So, they are willing to work uh, more under worse conditions for lower wage. The expansion of a typical work over the last decades in advanced economies, not dissimilar to the condition prevailing in non-advanced, so-called non-advanced economies, simply attests to that, to that. As said, whether a te tectonic change is in store for capitalism, whether we are transitioning to a post-work society, 
This is not simply a question of aggregate structural dynamics and technological change per se, but of social antagonisms that drive social transformations and that we are agents of. In what remains, I want to look back at the history of labor replacing innovations in order to indicate that the fatalist, account, fatalist accounts of the coming automation with their anticipation of mass employment actually obfuscate the aggregate substance of technological development under capitalism, and that is restructuring of capital labor relations. The economic tendency of technological development is an increase in the quality and speed of production, efficiency of labor, and productivity of capital. However, its social tendency is increase in the control over production process by the owners of capital, constant restructuring of the labor market, and curtailing of labor's organized resistance to the conditions imposed on it by the dynamics of capitalist accumulation. However, that social antagonistic character of technological development is frequently blackboxed in the prevailing dogma that innovation is spontaneous, inevitable, and best left to the invisible hand of the market. If we, maintain, if we want to maintain a transformational attitude toward capitalism, we need to maintain a, a confrontational attitude toward technologies. So let's do a short a review of history that probably everyone here is familiar with. Um, the era of industrial capitalism started with the technical division of labor into individual tasks. With the simplification of work tasks, the craftsmen became replaceable by unskilled workers. Although this unleashed a huge growth in jobs, a democratization of manufacturing labor of sorts, the effect of new organization and new technologies of production in the period of first and second industrial revolution were frequently a cause for worker discontent. Horrific labor conditions and brutal competition imposed on the workers resulted in the first collective struggles for workers' rights that took the form of organized smashing of the machines. The, the second major transformation started with the introduction of scientific management. Scientific management breaks down workplace tasks into individual actions and analyzes them in terms of time and motion needed for their execution. A production process that has been broken down on Taylor's principles can then be recomposed so, to, so, to, uh, so as to increase efficiency and impose on the worker the accelerated pace of machine-driven production. By reducing the control of labor over his or her own actions, this paves the way for the Fordist organization of the integrated factory system based on continuous flow manufacture, so production line, in turn giving rise to a new cast of technical professions in charge of design and maintenance of technological system. Slowly the innovation process itself stops being driven by inventions stemming from the production process and is separated out into a system of technoscience organized around R&D departments and universities. What workers have lost in terms of control over the production process in the large factory system they have received or they have gained in the capacity to mass organize, to obstruct the production and claim their rights. The third major transformation followed after the Second World War. With the introduction of automation, curiously enough, that term was coined in 1948 by a Ford Motor executive. So, with the introduction of automation, the skilled workers lost the last bit of control over the machines. They themselves became mere attendants to the machine, while their professional skills were made simply redundant. However, due to the post-war economic expansion and the strength of unionized labor across uh, many national economies, the majority of the workforce could find new jobs uh, as a result of uh, job replacement. The effect of automation was ac actually delayed. It was only with the advances uh, in cybernetics and microelectronics in 1970s and 1980s that the advanced industrial robots, so not CNC automatic laddies such as this one, 
started to enter shop floors and that a substantial replacement effect could become felt once the economic crisis of 1970s died down. In parallel, business computers massively entered the top floors, reducing the need for a number of clerical jobs. This has led to a polarization in the labor markets of advanced economies between a massively grow, growing low-skilled workforce in the service sector and a high-skilled workforce commanding the production. As analysts such as Tessa Mori Suzuki noted already in the early 1980s, this polarization was driven by a shift in the primary site of surplus value creation. It drifted from production to innovation, accompanied by a thorough reorganization of the techno-scientific process and the rise of so-called knowledge economy. Today, this historic process is continuing with a new round of robotization and computerization, that is, as said, threatening to do away with the occupations where human labor was until recently considered indispensable, such as transport, retail, construction, or even some high-skilled occupations such as paralegals. Um, advanced economies have seen enormous gains in productivity and wealth over the last decades. Why haven't these enormous gains in productivity result, however, in equally large levels of employment? In many advanced economies, uh, many advanced economies have, after all, seen a drop of labor force in manufacturing over the last decades, as this graph shows. So these are kind of G7 economies. Uh, but there was only small rise in structural unemployment. Why is that so? Well, the reason is that the replacement of workers by machines simply increases the reserve army of labor and thus drives down the cost of labor. Such labor can then cheaply employed in the next cycle of expansion of commodity production. At the same time, the gains in productivity lower the price of commodities and thus leave a disposable income that can be used to buy new commodities in these new markets. It is this mechanism that has allowed the industrial workforce to become a reserve army for the expansion of the low-wage service sector in the 1970s. Service sector boom was based on an on intense commodification of a number of needs, social needs, related to reproduction that before used to be mostly fulfilled outside of the market, such as recreation, cooking, health and healthcare, or entertainment. Based on such dynamics, the mainstream economics treat, uh, treats technological unemployment as a temporary phenomenon, that finds one that finds its resolution and technologically driven productivity growth, leading to economic expansion and finally restored employment growth. The workforce made redundant in the process must either acquire new skills and wait for new jobs or simply drop out of the labor market altogether. However, while over the last decades the technological change has had only modest effects on employment rates, it has disproportionately benefited the high-skilled labor and the capital. Eight men today own more together than the poorer half of the humanity. Five of those eight men are from the information technology sector. This begs the question, to what degree does the general direction of technological development condition social asymmetries such as these? And is this direction really necessary? What is its exuberant rationality that generates such spectacular economic inequalities while well, it could provide welfare for most of the humanity? Considering the historic pro process of productivity-enhancing innovation I have described earlier, it is clear that its social substance is constant reorganization of production for the purposes of ever-intensive capital accumulation. The process Marx has called the real subs subsumption. However, this general tendency is fought out as a constant ant antagonism between labor and capital over the concrete organization of production and allocation in reproduction. 
This is where abstract universal of capitalist development and concrete particular of its overcoming or contesting meet. In his seminal study, Forces of Production, a Social History of Industrial Automation, focusing on the post-World War II automation in the US, David Noble takes his cue from the statement made by Charles E. Wilson, the president of General Motors and at the same time Secretary of Defense, who warns of the two great problems the US is facing in those early days of Cold War, Russia abroad and labor at home. The immediate context of that statement was the fact that the World War II and immediate post-war period, despite the conditions of war economy, was marked by an unprecedented labor militancy and intensity of strikes that had resulted in substantial gains in wages and concessions in labor rights. Analyzing the early automation in those sectors that had participated in the war industry, primarily ma machine engineering, uh, Noble comes to a conclusion that the priorities for the military-industrial complex was first to neutralize the trade unions by drumming up the so-called red, red Scare, and then to reduce the control of labor over the process of production through introduction of automation. The worker who only attends to the machine can easily be replaced. The worker that can be replaced doesn't strike. Tellingly, the exclusion of the worker as a controlling instance led at first to numerous product faults and machine malfunctions, that is, a substantial loss in productivity. Nonetheless, the automation was carried through as the imperative for the management was to regain the control over the process of production and reduce claim-making capacity of the workforce. Thus, the automation is revealed as a direct means of class struggle. Um, well, the automation thus far hasn't resulted in a large unemployment in advanced economies. It has caused some, but not really large. There are indications that we might be facing more noticeable levels of unemployment in the future. Judging by the U.S. Uh, employment statistics, in the aftermath of the Great Recession of 2007, we are already witnessing the effect of technological change on the labor market. This crisis why was a trigger for uh, um, this crisis was a trigger to lay off relatively costly workforce. And in the recovery, ever cheaper robots are incentive not to bring it back. Productivity and output were restored much sooner than employment, as this graph shows. It shows how quickly uh, US uh, jobs recovered after various recessions throughout the uh, post-Second World War period. And you can see that uh, these cycles are getting longer and longer. Uh, about the reasons why this is so, I will not be talking in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, but we can go back to this in, in the QA. I think it's an interesting issue uh, about so-called the debate about steady state or um, um, profit rates going down. No? Um, sorry. sorry. Technology. And yet, the potential of new labor substituting technologies is not a foregone conclusion. We know that historically the deployment of technological innovations was not a linear process but was rather shaped by numerous adaptations, resistances, and failures. In fact, the deployment of new labor substituting technologies can stumble over three sets of obstacles. Let's go through them. The first is related to the introduction of a new technology into the process of production, where it has to undergo a number of adaptations to the extant machinery and organization of production. This process can frequently result not in the replacement of labor, but in additional labor needed in resolving interop interoperability, optimization, and mon monitoring issues uh, caused by the new equipment. Uh, the second is related to socioeconomic factors. The social costs of unemployment or a drop in the value of human capital due to technological change can lead to a resistance of the labor, unions, and political institutions 
in an attempt to defend the existing employment. The path, also, the path dependency due to technological choices made in the past can lead to an inertia and to struggle for market power by non-competitive means, stifling innovation. Externalities such as ecological impact can lead to resistance by activists and regulatory in intervention. As the economic historian John Mocker points out, history teaches us that if technological change is not accompanied by redistribution from winners to losers, the innovation will face major pushback in its deployment. In the neoliberal era of retrenchment, the winners can thus count on growing social resistance and it is our responsibility to provide it. The third set of obstacles is related to the structural dynamics of capitalism itself. Namely, if automation is driving down the price of labor, it lowers the economic motivation to replace workers with machines, thus slowing the, down the entire process of replacement. This is particularly the case in labor-intensive and technologically stagnant sectors where profits are low and don't allow for reserve capital to be accumulated to make investments into new equipment. Such is the case of a large segment of the service sector oriented toward end consumers, the subsector that employs a great deal of global workforce. This is also being now tapped in with various schemes of uh, uh, online on-demand uh, Transaction, transacting of labor, so uh, things like Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk and such, but maybe in the Q&A we can address that. Furthermore, investments into capital goods, growth rates and profit rates of global capitalism are at a low point. For instance, this graph shows this. For instance, investments of the manufacturing sector into the information technologies, despite the promises of the fourth industrial revolution, at our lower levels uh, than they were at the height of the dot-com boom at the end of 1990s. Given that labor is productive of surplus value, further reduction in labor and increase in technology would only lead to further erosion of profits. So this is a concluding thing. Uh, still, Spreadheading spread the computerization process that forms the basis for alarmist predictions of technological unemployment are giants that dominate the global digital economy. This is where the action is. They are trying to capitalize on the fact that they command large computing capacity, big data, and engineering know-how through intensive in to capitalize that they command these capacities through intensive investments and acquisitions in the field of robotics and artificial intelligence. For example, Google has been for years at the forefront of autonomous car development. In 2013, it acquired military-oriented Boston Dynamics uh, robot producer, while in 2015, it acquired uh, a leading AI company, DeepMind, that has uh, worked together with um, public British public health service provider, NHS, in uh, automating some of the clerical side of uh, operations in the healthcare. In 2012, Amazon.com bought Kiva Systems in order to automate uh, uh, its fulfillment centers, while in 2017, it op opened a fully automated grocery stores, store. Um, it soon closed. Facebook, Apple, Intel, and IBM are no laggards in the effort to divvy up the future of industrial uh, automation market either. These are mostly global monopolists who hold enormous reserve capital resulting from their fantastic financial market valuations and tax evasion uh, that they use in order to reposition themselves as the technological infrastructure purveyors for the future automation for other sectors manufacture, healthcare, logistics, military, or finance. This capital-intensive race has three major consequences on understanding what might the coming, coming automation look like. First, the next wave automation will likely not be a revolution in micro-production, you know, 3D printing and all that, where uh, even the smallest producers will have their own autonomous robots. But rather, the automation will be concentrated in the hands and developmental logic of a small number of big corporations. Second, 
to most, it will become available as an off-site service. They'll be able to buy or rent from these corporations. Economies of scale and network effects are important here. Third, as efforts of the European Union to protect privacy uh, or enforce taxes, uh, sorry, as efforts of European Union to protect privacy or enforce taxes show, the operation of global corporations headquartered in the US will be hard to regulate. There are several strategies that regulators will be forced to try in this situation in order to secure greater competitiveness um, for its workforce and stability, political stability and social stability at home. First, increase the baseline social security. For instance, uh, introduce basic, but in my view, but are not universal uh, basic income for those who are underemployed in perma permanent or typical work conditions. Second, intensify the free educational opportunities that develop the work skills, but more importantly, the least replaceable creative capacities. Third, increase, increase the bargaining power of fragmented labor force. Fourth, democratize the access to means of production. Failing that, they'll face a potential disintegration of that fundamental mechanism of social integration, participation in the labor market. In addition, they'll face the erosion of purchasing power of a large base of consumers and the problem, problem of a collapsing demand. However, what ultimately matters is whether we will be able to politically push through a post-work society. Part of that challenge is whether we will be able to wrestle the technological development away from so-called natural forces of the market and return it into the hands of societal steering. This is what, the, what organized labor has managed to contest par, par, partly in the earlier cycles of labor substitution. This is what Norbert Wiener has tried to do uh, when he placed himself at the service of United Automobile Worker, Workers Trade Union in the late 1940s to counter the threat of automation. Likewise, this is what the left bloc in the European Parliament to, attempting to tax robots uh, has done with a proposal that was neither too early nor unjustified, as its detractors claim, but rather too mon modest and disconnected from other social forces. Purposiveness of technological development is overdetermined by social ant antagonisms. And political opposition to technological development <coughs> makes antagonisms explicit. The purported prematurity of the parliamentary proposal only reveals the fetishistic consensus that technological development is best left to the market and its market set purposes must not be intervened into. However, it is clear to many that we need to change the social patterns of production and wealth re re redistribution so as to minimize the dependency on employment and, uncer and uncertainty from disruptive technological change. And last but not least, secure the environmental transition to a more sustainable social metabolism. Active intervention into an opposition of techno to technological development at the place of work, in the R&D, or in the policy arena is key to its social reorientation. If the technological change can disrupt the society, the society can certainly disrupt the technological change.